Welcome to Ask GMBN Tech. This, of course, is our weekly Q&A show. You ask the questions and hopefully I get to answer some of them for you. Get your questions in to the email address on the bottom of the screen there and you can add them in the comments at the bottom of the page. Don't forget to use our hashtag Ask GMBN Tech, especially if you're emailing in, put it in a subject header. Makes it nice and easy to spot your emails. Okay, so first up this week is from MTB forward slash ST. Dolly, I've recently decided to build a dirt jump bike. Can you explain the rear axles on them for horizontal dropouts? Thanks. Um, well, firstly, assuming that most dirt jump bikes these days have a 135 millimeter spacing between the back of your frame, you don't really need anything special. So the more important bit is actually part of the bike. So you can, with a standard quick release, run a horizontal dropout and a single speed. Now you can also, in an ideal situation, have a bolt through setup, uh, but that does involve a slightly heavier hub with a threaded axle, or alternatively have one that's got a hollow axle that's threaded at the ends and you can screw in bolts. Now the Canyon Stitch that you can see on screen now, uh, Blake has this bike and he has this exact setup on it. So that's nice and reliable because you haven't got quick release lever, you can crank those bolts up tight to stop things moving. But the real key with the horizontal dropouts to making sure that nothing moves, and of course you can get that correct chain tension, is a chain tensioner. Now not as a chain guide or a chain tension that you might see on a downhill bike or an enduro bike, these are very different. Their job very simply in the horizontal dropout is to move the wheel axle to a position that tightens the chain just enough. And it holds them there, then you secure your wheel and they can't actually move in any further. So there are various different types of these. You get ones built into the frame like this one on the Canyon Stitched, but then you get old school ones known as chain tugs. Now chain tugs go on the other side of the frame and they actually pull the axle as opposed to pushing the axle away. So the effect is basically the same, they're just a little bit more fiddly and they used to be really common in the BMX world, although most manufacturers now when they spec a dirt jump frame, they will be using integrated ones so they're known as chain tensioners. Um, nice simple setup, of course, if you have got the bolts it does make it a lot more secure and less likely to slip, but slightly more of a pain if things do slip because you need to get the Allen keys out to, to get it back up in the right place. Uh, that's about it, I think. All right, next up is from Cray Rennie. Uh, hi Doddy, I've just purchased a 2019 Trek Remedy 8, very nice bike that, uh, and it comes stock with 800 millimeter bars. I'm a female rider standing around five foot seven. I've had it for two weeks, but I'm wondering if they're too wide for me. What would be a good length? Also, can you please explain sweep and other terminology in regards to handlebars? Uh, love the videos, keep them coming. Uh, thank you, yeah, and we will. Right, so let's start off with this. So, well, firstly, it's a nice bike. Secondly, it's really cool that it comes with full length bars. Uh, the reason I say that is there's no sort of consistency in manufacturing with the types of bars spec on bikes. In an ideal world, to save on having to produce all these bars, it'd be better if they just all produced them at, uh, in my eyes at least, at 800 mil, and you can just chop them down to your preference. Because really there is no right and wrong as far as bar width goes, it is down to preference, unlike in the road world, where it's based on your frontal position and comfort and all that sort of stuff. In a mountain bike world, it's, there's a whole bunch of different reasons why you'd want different height, different sweeps, different width bars. Now typically a smaller rider might have a narrow bar and a taller rider might have a wider bar, but it's not always the case. I know plenty of shorter riders that love full width bars, but if you're unsure, what you really want to do is experiment first before you trim them down to get your preferred sort of width. Now I would take a wild guess at your height if you're unsure, try anywhere from 720 to 740, that might be a good place to start. And what you just simply want to do is move all your controls in. So don't chop your bars down and move all your controls in. Measure it, you could even go 10 millimeter at a time until you get to a place that feels about right when you're riding. Now it's not quite the same as actually chopping the bars down because you'll find when you've got your bars at your full width and they are chopped down, you'll move your hands around on those bars. And when you do this when the bars aren't chopped and the grips are just in, it doesn't quite feel the same, but it does give you a good indication of the area. And now something is worth trying, it's just asking loads of other riders similar heights to you, throw it out on a Facebook group, there's loads of sort of riding groups and there'll be some in your area, and just say, hey, hey guys, like guys and girls, I'm five foot seven, currently I'm running 800 mil bars, I'm not sure if they're right for me, what length is everyone else running, and just see, and you'll get a good indication of riders in a similar ballpark to yourself, what they're running, but I do reckon somewhere 720, 740 might be about right, but of course it is down to your decision. So um, hopefully you'll get that sorted fairly quickly. 
Okay, so as for terminology with handlebars, so let's look at these bars on screen. And the first thing we're gonna talk about is the diameter of the bars. Now the clamp area is where they're talking about and they typically come in two sizes. So 31.8 millimeters and 35 millimeters. Now 35 obviously is quite a lot fatter and you might think a lot heavier and a lot stiffer and the rest of it, but actually they're fairly close and a lot of the manufacturers I've spoken to say there's not that much difference between them, but there's such demand for people wanting those two different feeling bar setups that they offer 31.8 and 35. Now the rise, this is the next one. So this is where the rise is measured from. Simply put is where the clamp is on the bar upwards to where your hand position is. So you get various different rises available and they can tune your riding position. So the typical ones you tend to get are zero degrees, so that'll be like a cross country flat handlebar. Uh, I say cross country, it tends to be on cross country bikes, you see them, but it's not necessarily a thing that makes it a cross country bar, it just happens to be a flat bar. Then you'll get a 10 degree option, sometimes a 15, a 20. Um, you don't tend to get 25s, it'll go straight up to 30. And then strangely, it goes up to 38 rather than 40. Um, not quite sure why it's 38 and not 40 or 35. Uh, question I'm gonna have to find out for myself, but 38 seems to be the upper end of that. Now you'll get up sweep and then you'll get back sweep. Up sweep is literally just the angle the, the bars can basically angle up at towards the end there and back sweep is just the same with the bars curving backwards. Now the reason especially for back sweep is think about your hands and the position they actually are on your wrists. If you hold them out they're not straight so holding a straight handlebar is quite unnatural and will put your elbows in quite an awkward position. Now some riders like a really aggressive position on the bike and they'll want less back sweep and the reason for that is it puts your elbows out in that aggressive riding position but it's not as comfortable for all round riding so the more back sweep you have the comfier the bar is going to be for long durations in the saddle and the less it has the more aggressive it's going to feel but again it's down to what you like and what you feel there's no right and wrong. Now of course you can also especially with the higher bars you can roll them backwards and forwards to get similar effects basically and different effects. I quite like rolling my bars quite forwards because I like that position of having my elbows out but that is a total personal preference thing. And I often get people saying, oh is your bike too small, you have to roll your bars forwards. No, I just like rolling my bars forwards. Always have, probably always will. Um, it's a preference thing. If you look at G. Atherton's bike, here's a, almost the other way around. You know, so you could argue if you're going for a cruise, it'll make you very elbows down, but he certainly doesn't ride a bike like that. So it's just a personal preference thing. That is it. And hopefully that answers some of those questions for you. Okay, next up is from Zula CRO. Can I wash around bearings with normal water? Um, yeah, absolutely. In fact, just using water is probably the safest way you can wash just around bearings. It's not gonna get all of the sort of muck and stuff away from around the area as using a dedicated cleaner, um, but it's definitely a lot safer because cleaners, although they're not degreasers, do have agents in them that can break down those greases. So you have an inner and an outer race, then there's seals on either side, and then on the inside, although different to these, you'll have a set of bearings basically that spin around. Now the idea of these is the fact that the bearings sit inside in their own sealed microclimate of grease, basically, so they're nice and sealed and do their own thing. Now this works very well until you get degreaser or any other sort of cleaners into that that can break it down and then it's a matter of time before they just start rattling around loose and then I start wearing the bearing surfaces will pit and they'll become very grindy. In fact, that one's an old grindy one that I've got there. And then at that point they'll start rattling and they'll get loose, then you'll get play in your hub and then it's time for new bearings. So it's really important to make sure that you do keep them maintained and you clean around them. Now, a little hack that you can do just to increase the life on your bearings is by carefully taking off the, the seal using something very fine like this pick I'm using here. And then you can see the bearings on the inside there. Now, if you take both sides off, you can purge grease through. Make sure it's nice and clean in there and there's no grit in there. I can actually see that there's nasty stuff inside there. Apply fresh grease and then get those seals back in place. Then your bearings, provided they were just a bit lacking in the grease department should feel a lot smoother and will fend off water and all the horrible stuff a lot longer. Okay, next up's compression related or lockout related, in fact, from Tobias Fast. Uh, my son has a RockShox Sector RL solo air fork with a remote lockout on his Rock Machine Blizzard. 
The problem is the lockout doesn't work. The remote turns the blue disc on the actual fork, but there's no difference in the travel or damping, no matter if the lockout's on or off. I've tried searching for possible solutions without any luck. I've done a lower leg service, but never anything to the damper or the upper legs. Um, all right, Tobias, I think this is a bit of a process of elimination here. So if you remove the cable from that dial and just see by turning the dial if it does anything, because you could find that it's not being pulled around quite enough. And if that's the case, then you might need a new inner cable because it might be gunked up inside that housing and it's not able to put it through enough to turn that dial all the way around. If it is turning all the way until it stops and it's not having any effect on the compression, then it's likely to be something to do with either the oil level in there, like perhaps there's not enough oil in that damper, uh, could have leaked, or could have been like a seal could have burst at some point, uh, but you would notice that when doing a lower leg service because some of that oil would have pushed its way through into those lowers, or perhaps you just, when you did a lower leg service, it could have already been in there when you emptied that oil out and didn't notice. So that is a possibility and worth checking on. But I did hear, um, I looked on a few forums a while back and I remember from the Reba fork, which uses exactly the same style lockout dial on it and other sectors from a few years back. Some people having problems with the spring on the inside basically that activates that, just popping out of its seat. Um, now, if you're unsure about taking them apart, I, I can't actually tell because I haven't taken one apart myself. I can just imagine how that actually works. Um, if that has happened to you and you're not comfortable taking it apart, pop to your local bike shop and explain what I've just said. Um, and it might be a known problem that suspension tuners are aware of. If not, if you're not sure about it, take some photos of it and then you need like your local SRAM or RockShox Center to help you sort this problem out. And it is a problem that can be sorted and generally it's something quite simple. So hopefully your lockout will be sorted soon and your son will be back on his bike. Okay, next up from Zero Grand Arc. Hi Doddy, I had a crash recently from a jump. Um, I didn't disalign my rim, but my tire is. Okay, so you mean you didn't sort of buckle or damage your wheels, uh, but your tire is, so I guess it's wobbly on the rim. Um, what can I do to fix the tire? Um, well, hopefully your tire has just come unseated from the rim. So the rim will have a profile like this, and at the end of the rim, it has a kind of mild hook, and the tire basically hooks into that. So if it's become if it's popped out of that, part of the tire will bulge and it will move around. So the first thing you need to do is deflate your tire, give it a good sort of work it around and try and make sure it's in place and reinflate it. And then hopefully it will pop into place and everything will be fine. If it does look like there is the problem but it's not quite popping into place, get some warm soapy water, put it on a soft brush and brush it all the way around the bead of the tire, obviously with it soft, and then try it again. And it might be just there's a bit of friction between the tire bead and the rim itself and it couldn't quite pop into place. Obviously by jumping funny or landing badly, you could have just pulled it out of place. Um, and that will sometimes cure that problem. It's definitely a problem that occurs when you're setting tires up tubeless. So that's something I often recommend with that. If it's not, then quite likely the things happen is your tire has become delaminated. So the tire build itself is made up of several different layers which are bonded together. Now if any of that is torn or rips apart you get bulges, kind of like you can in motor vehicle tyres, uh, but generally if you get delamination on a car tyre or something that's a pretty bad thing. On a bike tyre it's not quite as bad but you get those annoying wobbles uh, and if that's the case unless you're happy riding with it, which I probably wouldn't, um, probably time for a new tyre so hopefully that's not your problem, um, but good luck with that. So there we go, there's another Q&A session in the back. If you've got any questions or any comments, leave them in those comments below. Let us know what you think, let us know what you wanna know. Uh, for a couple more tech related videos, hit them up right down there in the bottoms of the screen. And of course, don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you like the channel and subscribe if you haven't already done so. Cheers guys.